Good afternoon, and thank you for joining today's Pearson Institute speaker series. My name is Christelle Inema. I'm a Master of Public Policy student here at New Chicago Harris and a fellow at the Pearson Institute. I'm really uh, delighted to be here and to introduce uh, today's speaker, Ambassador Martin Kimani. The question we're examining today is a question that hits home and the reason I'm here at the University of Chicago. My first encounter with failures of policymaking um, and leadership wasn't through an internship or a class, but through community service. I went to high school in Gashora in the far east of Rwanda, near the border of Burundi. At the time, just like a decade earlier and a decade later, there were refugees who had fled political instability. So every weekend, me and my classmates would go to the camp to volunteer and help out with the kids. I wondered even then, without the slightest understanding of international law and public policy, whose responsibilities those kids were. They were stateless in its purest form and the conditions they lived in made it clear. For whom did they count? Who could grant them rights to have rights? This was the beginning of my journey that brought me here in hopes of seeking uh, solutions to African challenges. I'm honored to be introducing this lecture because of the emphasis in centering African agency and tackling so, uh, and solving uh, uh, the Africa's most challenges. Most importantly, I hope we can further explore what happens when the international community does not respect or support African leadership. How do we make sure that regardless of what the international community dictates, we're able to meet the mission and the needs of our communities? Using examples drawn from Kenya, the Horn of Africa, and the UN Security Council, Ambassador Kimani will illustrate the powerful difference made to peace and security when the international community and the people of goodwill respect and support African leadership. Mr. Kimai is the permanent representative of Kenya to the United Nations and the president of the UN Security Council since October 2021. He leads Kenya's team to the Security Council for 2021 term, 2021-2022 term. Ambassador Kimai is uh, a fellow at the Aspen Global Leadership Network and of the African Leadership Initiative. He also serves as the president, as the president's special envoy for countering violent extremism and the immediate past, past director of Kenya's National Counterterrorism Center. Prior to his role, Ambassador uh, served as a UN ambassador in Nairobi and as a permanent representative of, to the UN Environment Program and the UN Settlements Program. In the past 20 years, he has worked at, at a senior level in the global currency and bonds market uh, and peace and security in the Horn of Africa and East Africa. In 2016, Mr. Kimani was awarded the Elder of the Order of the Burning Spear by the President of Kenya for his service. He was Distinguished uh, African Fellow at the South, um, South Africa Institute of International Affairs. Ambassador Kimani holds a BA from University of New Hampshire, a master's degree and a PhD in War Studies from King's College uh, of London. And today I also learned that he studied the 1994 genocide against the Jesus. So I'm really excited to hear um, what you have to say to us. Um, please join me in welcoming Ambassador Martin. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Christelle, for that introduction. Um, I hope you can all hear me clearly. 
Um, I'll be taking a look at my notes every once in a while. It's not every day that you get invited to the University of Chicago to find some of the smartest students anywhere. So uh, it's as tough an audience as I'm sure I'm likely to find. <laughs> but thank you for taking the time to, to come here and, and listen to me. I also want to thank the Pearson Institute for this invitation. Uh, I think uh, when I was looking at um, the Pearson Institute at the Harris School, uh, I, I think it rarely has the world more urgently needed uh, some of the work that is being done here, especially when it comes to identifying and promoting um, uh, policy solutions that are empirically based. And of course, I know that is more difficult to do than it sounds. And perhaps uh, my comments here today will help at least those of you who seek to have that impact to have uh, a new perspective or one that adds to yours. Um, and of course, with a light touch, I know all of you have been deep, uh, deeply investigating the crisis in Ukraine. I'm sure you have the solution. And that by the time I get back to New York, you guys will have told me how it should be solved. And by early next week, it shall all be solved. <laughs> That's to the light, light touch. Um, Priscilla, you know, your, um, you're bringing up my um, doctoral work on uh, the Rwandan genocide against the Tutsi uh, really brings me, I think, to the core point, which is how the Rwandan people and the Rwandan state have chosen to uh, solve what is a uniquely human uh, problem of genocide. Uh, genocide is not an African problem, it's, it's a human, it's a global problem. And Rwanda has brought to it uh, cultural tools from uh, Rwanda's history and uh, uh, to, to how to deal with this vexing uh, and deeply um, damaging um, act. I remember, I, I always forget the, the writer um, there's a writer who starts his novel um, by um, asking what could possibly be done to deal with genocide, like uh, to memorialize genocide, to remember it. And he asks, do you, do you clear thousands of kilometers and build a monument that's thousands of kilometers big? Do, should it be seen from space? In other words, the attempt to solve such a deeply human problem is so difficult because it's so tiring. It's, it penetrates into everything. It fills all space. And so how to solve it is only partly solvable and because one cannot recover those who died and, or to be more precise, who were brutally uh, murdered. So that solution that the Rwandan people have brought to me brings me really to, I think if I was to stop my talk now, it would be that these solutions that I'm going to speak about are rooted in a sense of ownership of the problem and a desire to reclaim the future and to make the future be defined by more than the problem, more than the crisis of suffering of 1994 uh, and a future that is more shaped by the hope and aspiration of the living. And uh, so I want to just recognize that Rwanda has a lot to be proud of, um, even amidst all the continuing pain and trauma that continues to haunt the people of that great country. Um, I also want to, you know, just very briefly turn to really the pressing problem uh, back in, uh, in the Security Council, but of course globally, which is uh, the situation in Ukraine. And uh, to just paraphrase uh, African solutions to African challenges with, you know, European solutions to European challenges, that uh, the, the, the world is, uh, is crying out 
for a stable European security order. Um, that does not um, supersede our, our concern with the war in Ukraine and indeed our condemnation of the invasion of Ukraine by the Russian Federation, which Kenya has been very clear about. But we do know that going forward, in one way or another, we need a stable European order. In fact, the war in Ukraine has only reminded those of us who had perchance forgotten the enormous destructive energies that lie at the heart of European politics, that um, Europe continues to be the most dangerous flashpoint for global uh, security crises. The United Nations that I serve as a, as a delegate, uh, the Security Council within which I sit, I highly doubt would have existed without the catastrophes of the Second World War. And those catastrophes were caused by the dynamics of European expansionism, ethnocentrism, racism, and militarism. And it turns out that even decades of relative peace are not sufficient to overcome the impulse for domination and, 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 and other forms of, um, of political, of armed reaction to political crises. And so it is to imagine and just to say that uh, we first need, uh, the world has responded as best as it can, and that ultimately we will look for European solutions for this European problem. And we will support it as it emerges in the Security Council and elsewhere, and Kenya and Africa and indeed the rest of the world will celebrate such a solution because we depend on a stable global order for us to achieve our aspirations for peace, security, and uh, development. Now, African solutions for African challenges or problems. Um, I was reading uh, that this phrase, which is used so often and that I use so often, um, was attributed to the late George Aite. And those of you studying political economy or will, uh, will recall him as um, a very, a very uh, interesting uh, academic who sought to promote a libertarian economics uh, in Africa. And he rooted that not just in common, uh, in, 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 the, in the mainstream libertarian thought, and by that I mean uh, the Vienna School of the Libertarian Thinkers, but rather argued that there was in the history of many African nations a libertarian impulse or a libertarian understanding of the role of private property and exchange. Now, this was not a view that is uncontroversial because of course the other powerful uh, view that sort of is ranged against that is, is what can broadly be called African socialism. If you recall from Amilcar Cabral in Western Africa to Julius Nyerere in Tanzania, uh, to simplify it uh, and hopefully not to uh, and hopefully not to flatten it by doing that, uh, it's a, it's an idea that uh, African civilizations have had a uniquely collectivist uh, or human centered um, approach to private property and exchange, and so you can see that doesn't those don't quite go together, but they're both offered as African solutions. So that is first to say that African solutions are not one solution, nor are they harmonious, that they clearly are differences in point of view uh, to African solutions. Now, that's important to realize because something about this phrase uh, is, says, stay off, stay away, right? It's, it's African solutions for African problems. There's something about the phrase that suggests there's some other people somewhere who believe they have solutions for African problems. And the people saying African solutions for African problems are sort of a bit of doorkeepers, right? And, and that 
I don't think it's true, but can easily, because I think some people do see it that way, can easily lead to um, a sense of one solution and that one solution by one African of sufficient power then becomes the African solution to that particular African problem. That's not, I don't think that should be the case. I don't think that's what this famous phrase means. I think it means ownership by African people. The, calling it African solutions also puts a geography to this solution. It says it's not a Kenyan solution to African problems or Kenyan solution to Kenyan problems, even though clearly we do have Kenyan solutions to Kenyan problems, that we have a whole government dedicated to solving those problems. Uh, it, it, it says that there's something unique about the need for a united approach, an African unity in pursuit of solutions. But why would you need a united response? Is there, are these problems united? Are African problems all being experienced in the same way uh, at the same time all over Africa? Of course not, but it recognizes. And are there, uh, we, I just came out of a podcast where I was asked about African problems. Is there something uniquely, is there something like an African problem? Uh, genocide is not an African problem, it's a, it's a human problem. Uh, and poverty is not an African problem. War is not an African problem. These are part of the human condition. So I think African solutions is an act of claiming these problems that we're, we're suffering from and saying we need to come together to solve them together because the global environment in which we exist makes it particularly important that we should unite because without doing so, the global dynamics will not allow us each where we are to solve the problems that we're under. So there's something about African solutions to African problems that is a recognition of the global structure of power and decision making. Now, if I was to just bring that to, um, but before I, I bring it to the Security Council, uh, let me just comment. I was looking at, you know, I was looking at the various articles and essays and papers written about this phrase. And one of the most interesting and most recent I found was uh, a column in South Africa's Daily Maverick from the 22nd of March by Dr. Adeoe Akinola. Adeoe Akinola. That is titled, and I quote it, we must return to the true meaning of African solutions to African problems, but not where African elites are the problem. Now, this is just to bring back, uh, of course, I know when you speak at the Harris School, you're clearly only speaking to the elites. <laughs> just joking. <laughs> just joking. Uh, <laughs> um, but I am a member of that elite, uh, if only by way of my official role. Uh, and I agree about his strong sentiments about the governance gap, which is what he's bringing up. And I think those of you who are skeptical about this phrase, and I don't meet many people who are skeptical about it because they mostly don't dare tell me about their skepticism, but I know it's there. I know it's there. Uh, and he, he's talking about a governance gap. He's talking about problems we have in different states in Africa, if not all states in Africa. Um, and, and perhaps the hint of occasional self-serving uh, behind this phrase sometimes. Um, and so Dr. Kinola puts his, his finger on an important point. But of course, it's never that easy uh, or that simple, uh, on, especially when you lay the blame on a sort of amorphous, diverse, and a differently formed groups of uh, governance elites or elites of, you know, in whatever way you, you, you make that. He makes many constructive points. Uh, and one of them is, is the one that will bring me to joining this uh, African solutions to African problems to the work that we do in the Security Council. And that is his observation that good intentions do not necessarily form uh, good solutions. So um, in the Security Council, the Security Council is, to put it simply, a body that is defined by the tension between its legal underpinning and its procedural underpinnings. 
end the political settlement at the end of World War II, right? That's actually why it's unable to solve the problem of Ukraine today, this tension between the letter of the law and the political settlement. That political settlement was made without most Africans at the table. So it means that the political settlement that ended up with the UN Security Council uh, is deeply uninformed by African perspectives. And so we in the Security Council who are from African countries and African and, and the non-permanent membership category was added and three African states uh, were, uh, uh, are always in the Security Council for two year terms means that we find a Security Council that spends 60 70% of its time or its products dedicated to African crises or African conflicts. If in fact, if there was to be peace tomorrow in Africa and there was no Ukraine crisis, the Security Council would be the sleepiest institution <laughs> in the United Nations. They'd, they'd turn up, debate for an hour a day and then go home. And they wouldn't have that much to discuss. But why don't they have that much to discuss? One is because but some of the security order in different parts of the world has been more stable, but also because Africa and its political inability to leverage its power at the global level means that there's a lot of practicing of good intentions in Africa. There's ways in which Africans are unable to resist the stranger with good intentions, especially who has a lot of money, a lot of weapons, and a lot of interests. So when we're in the Security Council, we seek to shape the conversation to be closer to the decisions being made by the African Union uh, and the decisions being made by the Peace and Security Council of the African Union and by the heads of state and government of the African Union. That's not the only, those are not the, they do not have a monopoly on African solutions, but they have a unique monopoly on responsibility to African people. And it does not mean that because a decision is from the Peace and Security Council, it is superior to a solution proposed by a brilliant professor or student at the Harris School. But it does mean it has a greater sense of ownership. And that sense of ownership is really the key to its success. And if it fails, is the key to the adjustment to that failure and the new solution being put on the table. And so when we talk in the Security Council and say, listen to Africa, we're not saying Africa knows better than everybody. We're not saying African policy makers know better than everybody. We're just saying it's our problem and we want to take the lead in solving it. The fact that we should even have to make this argument itself is an indication of the power dynamics in the Security Council. And last year, we had a very famous case, uh, the last year and the year before, where St. Vincent and the Grenadines was a member of the Security Council and this uh, small island with a, with a relatively small population, uh, the smallest country to ever serve in the UN Security Council, came into the council and said, we shall align our position entirely with Africa and with the African Union. I think this was a historical act of people of African descent from the Caribbean, our diaspora, saying that we shall politically get to the most powerful table on the global stage and we shall promote Africa's interests. I think it's a historic, a historic action. And what, were they, what, what did that mean? First, it meant that the African Union's sixth region, we have five regions in Africa, the sixth region is a broad diaspora. But until this act, it had mostly been thought of as individual diaspora members. So those of you who either were born in the United States but of African descent, or those of you whose um, parents are newly arrived or families are newly arrived, or you are newly arrived, it was thought of as that's the diaspora. 
it's like a groups of individuals and communities outside Africa. But this single act created an entire, I think, new political understanding of what the sixth region means. It meant then that African solutions are not just for Africans in Africa. It also meant that acts of solidarity uh, and uh, the formation of coalition can produce an African solution to an African problem. So when St. Vincent left the, 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 the Security Council at the end of last year, uh, and we, have, we had one more year to serve, um, a, 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 an interesting um, um, uh, exchange happened between uh, me and, and my American counterpart, uh, 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 Linda. And uh, Linda said, who's African-American said, well, you know, I am the plus one. Now, now that St. Vincent has left, I am naturally the plus one. Because I'm African-American, you're African, this is Af Af <laughs> the African three plus one. And it was meant, uh, she's a brilliant diplomat and a, and a great friend. And, and it really brought us to thinking, what does our plus one mean? In other words, what does the African solution that we bring to the Security Council, how can the other delegations, if at all, join it? And of course, we, we then, in our retreat, we, we said, we'll, we'll keep this plus. And what that plus means is that any delegation from the American delegation, the French delegation, the Russian delegation, any delegation that joins with us in promoting the solutions we think are the most relevant can proudly come and join the A3. The, that's what we call the African countries on the, uh, on the Security Council. And so we find ourselves um, seeking, when we talk about African solutions, seeking to find what are those parts of the country, the region, the African Union that have uh, engaged with a the, with the problem and what do they need from the Security Council? Let me give you a few examples of, of that. There's an African mission in Somalia that is fighting Al-Shabaab. There is an African mission in Southern Africa, in Mozambique, that is combating terrorist organizations in Northern Mozambique. Just yesterday, the East African community released um, a communique uh, that described the decisions made by the heads of state of government of the East African community to open a two-track process to stabilizing Eastern DRC. And that is a, a political track where the, the president of the Congo will meet with the militia groups in the East and offer them a path to peace and disarmament. If they refuse, there will be a military truck, which will then insert, according to this communique of this conclave, uh, will insert a, a mission into Eastern Congo to uh, assert that security that the people of Congo and our region need collectively. So that now is going to, the Security Council is watching all that. And so we then, in the coming days, will be looking to get the Security Council to support this. And that support is very important because later, there are ways in which the, the, the East African Initiative needs to interact with the United Nations, with the peacekeeping mission in Congo, uh, and indeed the legitimacy of the Security Council so that we can have forward momentum in stabilizing this very troubled part of the world. Um, I'm coming almost to the end of half an hour. Um, and I feel like I've said most of the things that I wanted to say, but just to finish, um, let me say that part of, and, and to speak specifically to this audience at the University of Chicago, part of the African solutions require uh, a change, um, um, require a change, a global change. And that is because there are certain economic and political 
structures globally that are play a disproportionate role in either causing or escalating problems in Africa. So for instance, part of our problems, uh, and I think perhaps the leading one, is our relative uh, poverty, which then means that there's relatively little money to pay for the basic services that our citizens require and that make citizens feel that the link between them and the state is one that is beneficial and positive. And so one of those things would be, for instance, uh, changing uh, the agricultural subsidies that are given here in the Midwest to farmers who no longer farm, they just get money every, every year not to, you know, to, uh, and, and, and crops that are produced below cost and the subsidy tops them up. The same with the European agricultural subsidy. These are very, uh, you know, um, granular things I'm saying, but just that one thing, just that one thing means that African farmers who are sitting on the world's uh, greatest area of non unused arable land are unable to produce their crops at a competitive enough price to feed Europeans and Americans. If they could, the investment that would flow into the agricultural sector in Africa, not only for the export of food, and I'm not talking about is huge land grants, so you plant and take away. I'm talking that the production of food and investment in the agricultural sector would be so much larger than it is today that it would address one of the key drivers of poverty, which is unproductive uh, or, or uh, uh, subsistence level um, farming. So there is work to be done at the global level to sh reshape the relationship between um, the world and Africa in a way that enables um, Africans to better be able to solve the problems they have. The problem we want to solve is how to make our agriculture more productive. The problem that needs to be solved outside Africa is for subsidies to either be reduced or eliminated. So it means that part of African solutions are global. In other words, not every problem to be solved in Africa is to be solved in Africa. The African problems that need to be solved in Washington, D.C., at the World Bank and the IMF, the African problems that need to be uh, solved in uh, European agricultural policy. So African solutions are not just limited to problems as they manifest themselves on the ground in Africa. I, I don't want to go into... Um, and, and just one final point, I have a point here about sanctions and subsidies, is that when it comes to sanctions, uh, what, what we've seen, and, and not just sanctions, uh, what we've seen about rich country economic, monetary and fiscal response to crises tell us a lot. So after the 2008 uh, global financial crisis, uh, the, the COVID pandemic crisis, what you saw is an unprecedented opening of the taps. Now, that has its problems. Nowadays, you go to the supermarket in New York, where you used to spend $100, now you spend $150, etc. I'm sure it's the same here in Chicago. So there have been consequences. Um, when the, it was time for the sanctions against uh, the war in uh, Ukraine to to try and put pressure on the Russian Federation. We saw an unprecedented use of the global financial system to level that punishing action. So what this tells us is that when the richest countries have the will, they are able to re-engineer the very concepts of basic economics as practiced and promoted here at the University of Chicago. I'm sure the people in the economics department are horrified <laughs> at some of the excesses that have happened uh, over the last few years, unless uh, Chicago School of Economics has changed a lot, but uh, it was done. So it tells us that at the global level, 
there are certain structural problems that exist and that Africa suffers from. But the problem ultimately is the lack of will at the global level and in the different rich countries to solve those structural problems. And that is because there's a feeling of distance between them and Africans. And there's a sense that they want to come to us. They want to come there to the ground. They want to come there to the ground. But actually, what they need to do is to change some of those structures where they are. It's uh, subsidies, sanctions, and all the other forms of uh, political financial engineering that uh, happen. Those are so key. And how will we do that? We have to do it by ensuring that those people who leave schools such as the University of Chicago and who have bright futures as policymakers get to have a sense not of owning African problems, but of seeing Africa's condition as a unique metric of the state of the global system. A lot of problems that Africa is having are not a reflection of African perversities or peculiarities. They are a reflection of global realities. And so if you really are interested in changing the world, which I would imagine most of you are, then you should see Africa's condition, not merely as, let me go help Africans, but as a useful metric in understanding how the system works, whether it's a UN Security Council, whether it's the Bretton Woods institutions, whether it's your own government, wherever it is, you should see what is its contribution to the way global power operates. Once you have that in your mind, we Africans will do the rest. With all our shortcomings, with our sputtering start and stop and reversal and forward, we will get it done. Uh, because right now, we're trying to get it done inside a cage of geopolitical reality. And that cage needs to be opened up so that our excellence and our genius can truly shine. Thank you very much. Um, I will be very happy now to interact with your very critical thoughts, but be gentle, please. <laughs> So we're going to open it up to Q&A. If you have a question, Insan will come and bring you the mic. So just raise your hand. And please keep your questions to questions rather than comments and keep it concise if possible. Thank you very much, Mohishimiwa Timani. I was uh, smiling to myself when you addressed us as the smart students of the University of Chicago, because I am neither smart nor a student of the University of Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Paul Kalenzi. I'm, um, as you can tell, a Catholic priest. I belong, to, I belong to the Jesuit order. And I come from Uganda, but I spent quite a bit of my life in Kenya and I love Kenya and Kenyans. So me, on behalf of the South Africans who might be here, Karibu Sana to Chicago. So I'm, I'm here in Chicago to, um, to raise funds to start a Jesuit university in Kenya. And part-time, I go to, uh, I do a doctoral program at uh, DePaul University in business administration. And I find it very fascinating what you say about how African solutions also have to be global solutions. We can't do it on our own. My worry is that we come to the global arena as the weaker partners. And I'll give you an example of the Africa Growth Opportunities Act, AGOA, which was meant to, um, promote, develop the African textile industry, but which in fact had a provision that African countries would uh, have to take in as much secondhand clothes from the US as the US could, could send to us, which worked against the whole concept of you know, promoting the textile industry. And I imagine that came about because precisely we are the weaker negotiating partner. How? can we become a stronger negotiating partner? Um, I think I have an idea about what you said, being more together, working together, being more united. But when you think about, I don't know, the 55 countries of Africa, we all have very different um, ideas about how we want to develop. And that really, I think, works against the, 
our ability to negotiate as a as a as a block as one as one unit. So what what do you see as a solution to to this dilemma? Um, thank you very much, Paul. This is a very difficult question, and um, I, I really wish you the best in uh, the raising of the funds uh, to start this uh, uh, university. Um, you know, AGOA, AGOA is not a trade treaty. Uh, the African Growth and Opportunities Act is actually an act of charity from the United States that says uh, you can bring in your goods tax, uh, tar tariff free or custom free. The majority of Agoa, for those of you who don't follow it, the majority of Agoa exports from Africa to the United States actually uh, commodities, whether it's oil, uh, minerals, it's not really um, manufactured goods uh, or the kind of goods that, that produce jobs, but still it's appreciated. And, and also the, the quotas many Agoa can, uh, that Agoa gives, most countries have not fill, even filled them, right? So we didn't actually negotiate Agoa. We, we, it, it was just given gratis. And in fact, uh, there's now a chance that it's going to be shut down and finished. Maybe it'll be renewed again, but, and that cuts to the heart of the issue, which is that, serious investment that requires returns over a long period uh, needs a bit more of a runway of predictability. And so something that can easily be canceled or, or run out, I think next year or the year after, and then now it needs sort of Congress to agree to an extension, well, that's a bit iffy. And something that also happened that was interesting and I think more impactful than many people suspect, uh, and I've told this to some of my American friends, which was the canceling of Ethiopia's Agoa privileges. Um, I'm not judging whether that's a good thing in terms of the response of the United States government to the situation happening in Northern Ethiopia. I'm not, that is a separate issue. But what it did is that there had been an entire flood of investment into Ethiopia's textile uh, industry. A lot of it premised on those Agua privileges and the ability to export those goods into the United States. The fact that it was eliminated at the stroke of a pen because Agua has conditions on human rights, observation, et cetera, means that if you are going to put in $100 million into a concern that seeks to ex you know, um, export, then you're going to be so worried about the political risk, N not just of your of expropriation, the normal political risk measures, expropriation, there'll be unrest that will damage your, your investment, but you're going to be nervous that the interpretation of someone in the State Department may put your business on its deathbed. <coughs> Right. And so that's why the solution is not a core, it is a trade treaty. And that was what Kenya was seeking to pursue uh, with the United States and still hopes to pursue. Uh, it's a free trade agreement with the United States, a negotiated one so that it rests on stronger, uh, stronger foundations. On how can we work to be a stronger negotiating partner? You know, in negotiation, even weakness has its virtues. You know, when, when you're negotiating, uh, it's, like, uh, it's like playing poker. You can have a weaker hand, but you still win, you know? So first, the weaker position is not always a losing position. And for a significant amount of time, negotiators like myself will be dealing with a relatively weak hand compared to those opposite us. If we measure that against wealth, or military power. But I think we can overcome that through um, one, the urgency of our quest. Um, I find myself more urgent because um, we have further to go and it's a more urgent goal for us to win that negotiation, or at least get something from it. Um, usually the other side, it's not that pressing a matter for them. It's not that world 
you know, changing for them. So our urgency can give us a leg up. So that means the first thing is that we have to feel the urgency. Uh, we have to feel the urgency as civil servants. We have to feel the urgency when you represent African governments or people. You need to be driven by a sense of urgency. Next, you need to uh, be informed by the sort of deep cultural tools that African people have in their minds. So that even as you see me in my suit, uh, talking my nice English, uh, uh, I am an elder of the Gekoyo people, and we have a way we negotiate. We have a way we operate when it comes to that negotiating table. You just need to learn it. And what you will find if you're an African professional in whatever field is that there's a wealth of cultural richness in the background of your people that is of great advantage to you at the point of contact with the stranger, you know, and, and whether that stranger is a good stranger, you know, uh, one who's uh, seeking to harm or to help, either way, we have to lean back on who we are. Uh, then finally, of course, unity is more than a word. It is an operating system. It is a uh, an instinct towards seeking commonality and common points of view. I find one of the more interesting and slightly amusing practices in African diplomatic circles is to relentlessly call each other brother and sister. I mean, it's just relentless. Huh? It almost reaches a point almost of parody, huh? my brother or my brother. And, and it's a reflexive desire to establish familiarity and common cause. And it is continuous, it's happening all the time. And I think there's something about it that is very special that I haven't seen in other regional groupings. I will say for instance, that all of you who observe African geopolitics uh, will observe this very interesting uh, uh, happening. So when there's a war that starts somewhere in Africa, there's either a, another head of state or a group of head of states for another African country that will fly in. And you will then see pictures of them holding hands laughing, yeah? And usually the skeptics say, oh, look at those bunch of dictators this is laughing. But in fact, what's happening is a sort of peer review. Inside that room, they're asking, just tell us the truth, what's going on? What's going on with you? You're my friend, you're my brother, you just tell me. And this person will pour out their heart. This is what happened. This is what I'm scared of. This is what I'm trying to get to. And those other guys is what they're doing. Then these guys say, can we have permission to go also and talk to them? Then, you know, it's done that way. And so if you find the African record of negotiating peace in Africa, it's actually very good. It's very good. There's a, there's, there's, it's frustrating. It can take long but there's a very proud tradition of African peer relations in negotiating for peace. So by unity is we now have to operationalize some of these ways of doing things. So that by the time we get to the, to the, to the, to the negotiating table, we're able to be informed by this knowledge. Within the Security Council, I have learned so much about procedure and how to first create, how to take your good intentions as a, a, as a permanent representative and seek to turn them into procedural process that will remain after you have left. And one of those last mile problems we have in many African negotiating problems is where poorer than we should be at institutional memory and how to turn institutional memory into negotiating position. So you will find uh, you're, you're negotiating with someone from a Nordic country and they've kept very careful archives of, of the way they, you negotiated with them in 1974. <laughs> you didn't keep careful archives. So then somebody springs on you like a little point from 1974 and suddenly you're at sea. Right, uh, and you're so we have there's practical work to be done underneath that word unity, 
uh, that has to do with archiving. It has to do with process. Uh, this is technical work that is can be seem very boring, but it is of such critical importance. If you can imagine uh, me as your negotiator coming to the table with the full benefit of what did what precisely not only the outcome of the different negotiations Kenya had while it was in the Security Council, but the reasoning that informed that decision. And for the next time we're in the council, if it's in 20, 30 years time, because you know, strangely, these problems just persist, huh? uh, that my the future permanent representative of Kenya will have the benefit of how I was thinking and why we reached the decision we did. So that speech, for example, in Ukraine, which went all over, it's not just merely what I said, but what was it made of? How was it made? What was it speaking to inside our national interests, our national security interests, our, our global posture, our moral sensibilities? So that is what it'll take to, to become stronger negotiate, negotiators for Africa. And I'm sorry, Paul, I've used your question to really go <laughs> into a whole other thing. But all the best to you and, and you know, the, the great work you're doing. Please choose. There's so many hands. <laughs> uh, I'll take a question from over there. Oh, come on. Yeah. Thank you for your time and for your thoughts. My question is about the United Nations Security Council. You spoke about the legal and procedural <coughs> and political settlements that have not been inclusive of Africa when they were when the council was established in the post World War II order. So if you had a magic wand and could reform the council to be more inclusive of African interests in the future, what would some of those reforms look like? Okay, I can take another one here. Thank you, Ambassador, for being here. Uh, my question is based off the last point where you made about sanctions and subsidies. Currently, we have a class infrastructure and development where we've been exposed to the myriad of possibilities when it comes to foreign aid. And what are your thoughts in terms of, from a policy perspective, when it comes to collaborative aid, which is essentially what China is doing versus Eurobonds? And I mentioned Eurobonds specifically because Kenya has such a dark history when it comes to Eurobonds. Taking into consideration our human capital, brain drain, and just African, Africans as a people wanting a better free flowing economy. What do you think is the ideal way forward for, in terms of foreign aid? Okay, let's take one there at the back and then we'll come to that side. Oh, actually, we have like online Q&A. Oh, There's we a... do. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. So the question from online says, could you share some thoughts on how Africa can successfully navigate the impeding shift from fossil fuels, which is expected to create enormous demand for minerals and metals, which are abundant in Africa? And on the other hand, continuing to press forward with economic diversification efforts, which remain a shift away from primary commodities towards, towards more high value and complex products. Okay, let me take those and then take another round, perhaps, before I escape to lunch. <laughs> um, well, you know, if I had a time machine and I was transported back to when these negotiations were being held, uh, in fact, one of the more interesting things is, uh, I, I, uh, is where the, that they were negotiated even as the war was still hadn't ended. Uh, that's when the negotiations started. I find that, that, that there was so much vision um, after that. I, I really admire those um, men and women who, who crafted, uh, who started the, the, in, the, 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 the journey of creating the United Nations. And I, I also have to say that, you know, um, the end of World War II, if I just, well, I had a bout of COVID in December. So I was isolated and I spent the time reading this biographies by 
the people who were there at the founding of the of the UN. And the different, um, there are many different accounts, but what struck me is the note of humility. I think after the catastrophes of World War II, um, there was a sense of something really does need to change. We really need to find a real solution to end this kind of war. So many people had died. It had been such a catastrophe that the, these mostly men uh, and mostly European uh, and, and American had a sort of humble humility and they had a, a, a much greater sense of fidelity to the idea of collective action against aggression and against war. After all, they had worked together. Many of them had worked together to defeat uh, the Nazis uh, and had done so even with radically opposed ideologies. Imagine uh, the United States and the Soviet Union uh, as allies, but they could not be more different in how they thought. So if I was to then be transported to that time, I would imagine that I, I would, uh, that I or whichever Kenyan would be transported to that time would be meeting with a group of people who were particularly ready to listen. Given, of course, we were colonies at the time, so I would have to be transported back there as an independent country. And part of the evidence of their willingness to listen is that the first articulation of the Bretton Woods institution was not the financialization of Bretton Woods today. It was actually to they were meant to manage ex fixed exchange rates and they were meant to have an impact on the real, real economy and not just finance. I, I'm not an economist, but they were much more concerned with reconstruction of real economies, jobs, getting factories and workers uh, working, getting wealth built and people having that wealth. Um, and then later it took a turn for a variety of reasons, the floating of the dollar, um, going off the, 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 the fixed exchange rates uh, and the coming in, you know, into the 80s, et cetera, which we, can, we don't have time to get into. So I would say you asked a simple question, but it's a difficult one. The surface answer would be that I would want uh, there to be uh, at least one, if not more, uh, African countries with veto power in the Security Council. I am not sure I would call for the elimination of the veto because the post-war settlement was such that this uh, victors of this war um, knew that they were about to immediately embark on forms of rivalry and that they needed to keep these major powers at the table and not fighting against each other. And so the veto was given not just as a privilege, but as a profound responsibility to, to, to prevent catastrophic war. So I would want for an African country to, to have that veto. And if it were today, of course, the automatic question is which African country? Of course, naturally, any African diplomat in the back of their head thinks it's their country. But I now know enough about the Security Council to know the awesome responsibility and weight of having the veto. It's a very difficult thing to wield. Uh, and to have in your in your drawer, uh, and so it need, it would need to be connected to a way a structured way of expressing African interest. It would need to have a deep structural linkage to the African Union. So again, the whole of Africa would need to be independent. You see what I mean? It's, it's and, and, or, or at least a lot of Africa would need to be independent. At the time, Ethiopia was there. You know, uh, Liberia was there. Uh, one of them should have been should have been given a permanent seat at the uh, at the and why not Ethiopia you know uh, so but it would have needed for that country to then that veto to express more than its national perceptions but to express uh, uh, this so our veto just uh, uh, I think it would have been wielded a tremendous number of times by now yeah um, on. On um, collaborative aid, um, you know, there's so many, and whether China versus Eurobonds, 
Um, I, I always like to be clear, like I always want to distinguish between grants and loans. And I never want to call loans aid, because like when your banker lends you money, they're not aiding you, <laughs> they're, they're lending you money. You're going to pay back with interest. It's an investment for them. So a lot of uh, engagement with Africa when it comes to the transfer of money is, is really in the, in the form of loans. And it's good to get loans because after all, it's an indicator that you are seen to be good, good, for, good for it. Um, and then the person lending you needs to have a risk perception that allows them to lend you money. So in that way, a loan is not, there's something also positive about that, that loaning. But, but the majority is loans. Now, collaborative aid. I, I think we have to, the aid system is not going to go away anytime soon. Uh, uh, it, there are a lot of critiques I'm sure many of you have of it. There are also many defenses. But I think we are going to need to find a way to address the risk premium in Africa. And that risk premium is deeply uninformed by pricing. So when those of you who are spending a lot of time at the Booth School know that capital is ready to take almost any amount of risk as long as it can put a number to it, yeah? Part of the problem with many African economies is that you don't, you don't have the data, the data set. So what's left is a sort of amorphous BBC driven perception. But money is ready to take enormous risks. If you look at the startups, the kind of crazy ideas that money is being thrown at, the levels of failure of those startups is so high. So there's a lot of risk appetite in the world but there needs to be more uh, uh, data to, to inform the African risk premium. If you look at some of the way that debt is priced versus the history of default, it's not defensible, right? But without putting the data there, uh, hell, you know. So it's not, easy, it's not enough to just say, oh no, they're discriminated against. We do need capital. And I, there's a historic, marriage that needs to happen, but it's not happening. And that is the marriage between the vast amounts of capital in Europe that need to grow fast because of a rapidly aging population that is soon going to retire and needs services and a check in the mail. And Africa with this young population that has such a deficit of affordable capital. This is a historic coming together that needs to happen. Aid won't get us there. It's a deep understanding of the opportunity, a vision or visions of the, of the opportunity. To get to grasp that opportunity, you must strip away racism, strip away forms of, uh, you know, superior, inferior, all these strange illusions uh, that people seem to be invested in. It's a sort of emotional, psychological stuff. It needs a lot of therapy. Uh, so, it, we, it, but once that opportunity is seen and you have leaders uh, in, in the private sector, in government, especially in the West, who see it, then it'll be amazing. It, it'll, it'll make Africa a center of global, global growth. Um, Finally, there's a question on fossil fuels, minerals. This is a real vexing issue to the online uh, person asking this. Not, it doesn't vex me, but it's, it's, it's very difficult. In Glasgow, this last time, it was amazing to hear countries that are the greatest emitters and users of fossil fuels saying that Africans should not use fossil fuels. I, sorry, I, I just couldn't. I, I, I didn't understand that. The idea <coughs> that the green, the transition to green requires Africa to stay poor is totally unacceptable to us. We reject it in its entirety. 
we will not get, stay poor to meet the aspirations of the rich. Yeah? And I, I say that as emphatically, because it needs to be said and said often. For Africa to grow, for Africans to join the global middle class is not going to add that much compared to the emitters today. So we have to do chew gum and walk at the same time. Africans have to use fossil fuels. Africans need to industrialize, even as the world does climate change mitigation. Otherwise, the response to climate change is short African lives and brutish conditions for the African people. It's not a deal Africa is going to sign up to. Uh, now, the other part of the danger of it is that the Af there are key African minerals in Africa that are key to renewables. So part of the march to zero, which, you know, that, that's a whole other argument. Part of that march, the intention to zero is very dependent on certain African minerals. How those minerals are extracted and used for that transition is key to African peace and security. That extraction needs to be peaceful. It needs to have African countries adding value, African companies, African people adding value to those minerals before they're exported out. My iPhone needs Congo. Congo needs the benefits of this iPhone. It's $1,200. How much? Of course, the majority of that is for a brilliant engineer, deservedly so. But in, in the material costs, in terms of the materials, uh, we need to find a way to ensure that the green transition, the transition to green, is supportive of African peace and security, not the opposite. So sorry, we are really out of time. Um, <laughs> if you have time to chat with folks one on one after that, after that'd be great. But um, if not, we understand. Thank you so much for joining us today. I want to thank again the Pearson Institute, the Harris School, the University of Chicago. You guys are very kind and um, I'm, I'm not far away. Any of you can reach me through the mission and I am always, and I mean that, I'm always ready to speak to students, whoever they may be, because I always feel as if it's stealing a match on history. It's getting the person before they become <laughs> their person, right? So just reach out if you want to engage with us. We also have a program where we will be looking for remote interns, especially who have economics experience to help us as we serve on the board of UNDP. And we want experts who can go into very deep analysis of the work that is being done and allow our delegation to put the best foot forward. So thank you very much and have a great day.